Uh, I want to continue where Apostle left off uh, last Sunday, and he spoke about end time living. End time living. How to live on earth while preparing for heaven. And you know, when we begin to live on earth when, with heaven in mind, it changes the way I talk. It changes the way I treat people. It, it changes the dynamics of my family. In fact, when I live on earth with heaven in mind, it affects everything I touch and everyone I speak to. Why do I say this? It's because when I, when I live on earth with heaven in mind, I understand that I have purpose and that I'm heaven bound. And I've come to tell you this morning that there is purpose for your life. All right, there was six of you. Thank you, Daniel. We've got one who's got purpose. Do you know every one of you have purpose? Come on, look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, there's purpose in your life. There is purpose for your life. You see, working an a eight-to-five job, that's not purpose. That's a job. That's something we do. Purpose talks about what is the aim for my life. Purpose talks about what is the direction of my life. Purpose talks about what am I created to do. I've come to tell you this morning, you weren't just created to do filing job. You weren't just created to answer phones. You weren't just created to, to manage people or to run a company. All those things are important. But I've come to tell you, your purpose is much greater than that. Your purpose has eternity in mind. Come on, I want you to hear me this morning. I'm going to put a fire under you this morning. Are you ready? Your purpose has eternity in mind. Now, I know I can already feel what some people are saying. Me? Purpose? Do you know where I've come from, Samuel? Do you know what education background I've got? Well, I've come to tell you that if you are a human being, which I believe 99 point, no, 100% of us are, if you are a human being and you have received Jesus into your life, there is purpose for your life. Because there is a gift in you, there is a talent in you, there is an ability in you, God has put it in you. And if you think you don't even have any of those things, I've come to tell you there's something greater than any gift. His name is the Holy Spirit. He is the greatest gift. And when He is in you, He gives you the mind of Christ. And you can do anything when He is in you. For greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. So you have the greatest gift. You have the Holy Spirit. So I've come to tell you there is purpose. There is that you are so special to God that God made sure there's not one person like you on this planet. If you can't tell me that doesn't mean there's purpose, there's not one person on this planet that has your fingerprints. That tells me that there's purpose for your life. That tells me that God has a plan for your life. And I love what Apostle said last week. He, he spoke about that as Christians, we cannot isolate ourselves from the world. Neither can we participate in the world. But what we need to be is we need to be an answer to the world. Because when we have the Holy Spirit in us and we have this gift, we have the answer above answers. He is the answer to the world. Amen? You know, Jesus said that we are to be the light and we are to be the salt of the earth. That is our purpose. Our purpose is to bring light. In other words, if we are to be light, it means you bring illumination where there is darkness. Where there is darkness at work and where there is darkness at home. Because Jesus lives on the inside of you, there is a light that shines. And his light will bring illumination to their darkness. It brings illumination to their path. It opens their eyes to things around them. If we are to be the salt, salt brings flavor into people's lives. I want you to know, just be, because you are at your company, your company is doing well. I want you to know, just because you are on the phones at reception, whatever business you're at, it's because of you that company is doing well. Do you know why? Because you bring the salt. You are the salt of the earth. You know what salt does also? Salt brings healing to wounds. What does that mean? It means whoever we touch, wherever we are, when we touch people and Jesus lives on the inside, his healing power, his salt rubs on their wounds and brings restoration and healing. I've come to tell you, I've come to encourage you today that we have purpose. You have purpose and it has eternity in mind. Come on, tap your neighbor, tell them, I have a purpose. And I believe, church, that when we begin to find our purpose, And we begin to walk in our purpose, it brings joy. I really believe today that Christians are unhappy, not because of their relationship with the Lord, not because of their church, not because they're serving. They're unhappy because they haven't found their purpose. 
And when, you, and when you find a puzzle piece and it fits in the right place, it's like it fits. Well, that's what happens when purpose comes into your life. You find the right puzzle piece. Joy comes into your life when you find purpose. And you know, end time living is going to require that we as Christians move and step out of old lifestyles. It's going to require that we as Christians move out of religious thinking. And that we move into stepping into spiritual positions. It's not enough for just the pastor and the leaders to have a spiritual insight. Do you know that you can have spiritual insights? I don't hear any amens. Come on, husbands, you have spiritual insight to your family. Moms, you can have spiritual insight to what's happening with your children. Those are the positions that God wants us to step into. And so this morning, I want to speak to you about one of the keys. If we're going to step into purpose, if we're going to step into these spiritual positions, if, if we're going to move into spiritual realities, here's the key. Are you ready for it? It's found in the book of Daniel, chapter 11, verse 32. And I love this. Here's the scripture for today. It says, but the people who know their God shall be strong. Someone say strong. Now, you must say it with the Joburg attitude. Strong. strong. Come on. Someone say strong. strong. The people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. In the NIV, it says, but the people who know their God will firmly resist him. In other words, resist the enemy. In the Amplified, I love it the most, it says this in verse 32. The, but the people who are spiritually mature... And know their God will display strength and take action. Come on, I've come, that's what I've come to do today is we need to take action. We, we cannot just sit and do nothing anymore. That We've got to take action. God is raising up a church that is full of strength and power and authority. It's time to take action in Jesus' name. Amen. And you know, this verse is found in, the, in, in, in Daniel chapter 11. But I went and did some research and found it that in chapter 10, 11, and 12, they fit together. In chapter 10, Daniel has this vision. Very confusing. It's all about wars, he, and he doesn't understand it. And in chapter 11, an angel is sent from heaven to explain this vision to Daniel. And if you go read it up and you do research, you'll find that it basically it, it points to the Persian Empire. He has visions of the Greek empire and its collapse. He has visions of, of the conflict between Egypt and Syria. And then in verse 36, he ends with the great dictator, the Antichrist, and the battle of the great tribulation. And, and all th this war that's going on about to happen, Daniel talks about, there is this little verse in the middle of all this confusion, all of this tribulation, all of this war. You know what it is? It's this verse, if my people, but my people, who know their God shall be strong, shall be strong and carry out great exploits. It's time we live a life not only knowing about God, it's time to move into knowing Him. Church, we know the promises and we know about God. But this verse says that if my, but the people who know their God shall be strong. You know, for example, I, I know about Nelson Mandela. We all do. We know where he came from. We know the conflict. We know the struggle. We know how he rose to power, brought South Africa back. We know all these things. But do you know him? Do you know his thoughts? Did you, did you know his desires? Did you know his emotions? Did you know his likes and dislikes? We don't know him. We knew about him. You know, if there's someone we need to know, it's our spouse. Hello, somebody. Husbands, we need a PhD in wifeology. <laughs> right? We need to know. We need to know our God. And so I want to share with you quickly five advantages of knowing God. And then I want to talk to you about how do we move from a life of just knowing about Him to a life of knowing Him. There's a big difference. And here, here's the big difference. Here they are. Five things. Number one, those that know their God, number one, will have power and authority. Power and authority. The first thing that we can enjoy as believers is understanding our power and authority in Jesus' name. 
That's what Daniel says in chapter 11. The people who know their God shall be strong and they shall resist the enemy's plans. What does being strong mean? It means that, uh, that we shall stand in times of adversity. What does it mean to be strong? It means that when we are weak, his strength is made perfect in our lives. What does it mean that when he is strong? It means that when opposition comes in like a flood, God says, I'm going to raise up a standard. That's what it means. That in my weakness, his strength is made perfect. You know, you see, I thought of this the other days, you know, for David. It was not that David was strong on the outside that helped him defeat Goliath. It was that David knew the strength of his God that brought down Goliath. He knew his God was going to stand with him. He knew his God was going to take Goliath down. He didn't have the ability. He didn't have the experience. He's never been in war, but he knew the strength of his God. He knew his God. People that know their God will have power and authority. Number two, those that know their God will have peace. Have peace. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 2, it says this, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Again, here we go. It talks about knowing Him. Knowing Him produces grace and peace. How many know that in the times we're living right now, we need the peace of God? We need the grace of God. How is it going to come? Is when we get to know Him. We can only enjoy God's help to the extent we know Him. Let me say that in a different way. If we don't know him, you won't be aware of what help is available. All right, let me put it another way. How about this? If you don't know the benefits of your medical aid, they're going to make you pay. Come on. Hello, somebody. If you don't know the benefits, they're going to make you pay. But when you know what your medical aid benefits are, what happens? You call them up. Oh, by the way, you're supposed to pay this. You're supposed to cover this. Oh, they're going to pay it. Well, let me put it this way. When the enemy knows what you don't know, and he knows you don't know the benefits of who God is in your life and the, the blessing and the authority that you have, he knows that you don't know, you're in trouble. That's why we've got to know him. We've got to know his promises. Number three, those that know their God will have wisdom. Wisdom, I love this. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17 says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Here it is again. In the knowledge of him. In other words, again, knowing him brings wisdom and it brings revelation into your life. That those that know their God have access to this wisdom. They have access to discern spiritual truths. You know, I believe that this verse means that people that know their God have a spiritual understanding that far surpasses formal education. And I'm not, I'm not saying formal education is not important. That is important. But I'm telling you, when you have access to God and when you are close to Him, you have access to His wisdom. Hello, somebody. Those that know Him that have access to wisdom and have access to Him, that means He's able to bring ideas to, to, to you. He's able to bring solutions. You've got problems with work, colleagues at work? I've got an answer. Tap into him. He'll have a solution for you. You have a problem at work you can't fix? Tap into him. He'll have a solution for you. Hello, somebody. Your car's broken. You don't know how to fix it? Tap into him. He's going to show you where the problem is. I know he wasn't sure about that. <laughs> I've seen it with my dad. My dad, he prays for his car. He says, Lord, I don't know what the problem with my car is. Please show me. God gives him the, the insight. He goes to the mechanic and says, I think the problem is there. Bam, there it is. You get close to him, and he's going to reveal. He'll give you wisdom, give you discernment. And you know, there's a great example uh, in the book of Acts chapter 4. And I love this example. It's about Paul and John. And they're talking about Jesus, and they're, they're making quite a stir. And the, the Sahedra, and they are there, and they're so upset with them. And so they pull them out of the synagogue, and they bring them into their court, and they surround them. And they begin accusing Paul and, and they accuse them of all kinds of things. And they're throwing questions at them continually. And we read that in Acts chapter 4 from 7 to 12. And they're bombarded by all these accusations. But the most powerful thing happens is Paul and John begin to stand there and begin to answer these questions. And here we see what happens in verse 13. We read it to you. It says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. Who's they? The Sahedrin. 
when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were uneducated and they were untrained men, they marveled. I don't know about you, but I want people to marvel of what God's doing in my life. Come on, they were, they were fishermen. They were untrained, but they saw the boldness and the power of God. Why? Because they had realized, it says there, they had been with Jesus. You see, you can be uneducated, you can be untrained, but when you walk with Jesus, you have access to wisdom. You have access to wisdom. Hello, somebody. You have access to wisdom. That when you're with Jesus, you have access to wisdom. Come on, tap your neighbor and tell him, I'm going to be wise. Because I'm next to the wise man. Amen. His name is Jesus. Okay, number four. When we get to know him, we will experience growth in our lives. Someone say growth. Colossians chapter 1 verse 10, it says that they may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him. Here it comes. Being fruitful in every good work. It doesn't say some good work. Being fruitful in some things. No, it says being fruitful in every good work. And increasing what? In the knowledge of God. Again, knowing Him causes fruit to, be, to, to produce. Knowing him increases the fruits in my life. Every good work, what does that mean? It means my spiritual life grows. When I get close to him, what does it mean? My business grows. Hello, somebody. When I get close to him, God says, I'm not going to leave you where you are. I'm going to take you further. I'm going to take you from glory to glory and from strength to strength. There's something about getting close to the Lord that brings, brings growth into your life. Come on, how many of you need growth in your life? Lord, you see these hands? Father, we need growth in our lives. That as we get close to you, growth will come in every direction. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Number five, those that know their God will have freedom. Freedom. John chapter 8 verse 32 says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth. You see, it's not that the truth will set you free. It's knowing the truth. You see, we always say uh, the truth will set you free. We know. Jesus, whoever the Son sets free, is free indeed. But you need to know the truth for the truth to set you free. You need to know Him. If we're going to be people that know our God, we're going to have access to power and authority. If we're going to know our God, we're going to have access to peace. We're going to have access to wisdom. We're going to have access to growth in our lives. We're going to have access to freedom in our lives. So how do we move now from just knowing God about him to knowing him? You know, and it all comes down to a personal relationship. Personal relationships. I know every one of us here must have a personal relationship with somebody. And when I thought about personal relationships, there are a few things that we have to look at. To have a personal relationship, the first thing you need is time. And all the wives said amen. And then it's communication. Oh, the wives said amen again. Then it's resources. Oh, my word. I think my wife wrote these out. <laughs> then it's listening. Then serving. It's laying your life down for the other. It sounds like a good marriage right there. But that's how we build personal relationships is through time. Putting time aside for the person. Communicating with the person. Putting resources. Spending money. Valentine's next Friday. By the way, guys, didn't you know? <laughs> listening. Serving. And this is how we build a relationship with the Lord. This is how we build a personal, how? By spending time communicating with Him, putting resources to Him, serving Him, laying our lives down for Him. Because the people that know their God, they don't just know the contents of His story, they know the author of history. You can take that, Samuel. I made it up. Thanks. Thanks. See, it's not good enough just knowing the story. It's, it's, it's better to know the author who wrote history out. It's not enough just to know the promises. It's to know who wrote the promises, who's implementing the promises, and that's the Lord. It's to know Him. It's to know Him. And this morning, I'm putting a challenge out today to every one of us is that we, need to, we, we cannot be sleeping anymore. We cannot just play church anymore. It's time that we as Christians know our God. We know he's alive and we know he's mighty. And we know that there's purpose that he's put in our hearts. And it's time that we step out. I want to read the scripture to you. It's just a few verses and it's 
when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane in Matthew chapter 26. Thank you, Brandon. It says this, it says, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee. And he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch just with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. For the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and he found them asleep again. For their eyes were heavy. Verse 44. So he left them, went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is being betrayed. You know, and I thought about just this incident and it reminded me of the church today. There's a time where God is calling people. There's a drawing from the old to the new. And then he says to the, the three of them, he says, listen, watch with me, pray. Spend time with me. Help me. And he went away and he came back and he found them, he, he found them asleep. Three times he came back. You know, and I was thinking about this, you know, the Lord said to me, you know, generally today the church is asleep. We come Sunday after Sunday to be woken up. Wake up, church. Come on, let's praise the Lord. Let's worship. We, we get the word. We wake everybody up. Monday morning, we were asleep again. And you know why? It's because we've forgotten our mandates. We've forgotten that there's purpose for me on Monday. That there's purpose for you on a Tuesday. And there's purpose for you on a Wednesday and a Thursday, a Friday, even a Saturday. And we're just like these disciples. Yes, Jesus, we're coming. We'll be awake. We're going to pray. Sundays we wake you up and Monday we're asleep again. And this morning I've come to say it's enough. We're going to stop this church. We're going to be a church that knows our God. We're just not going to know about Him. I know so many Christians, they can read this book from front to back, but there's no power in their lives. Do you know why? Because they don't know Him. We've got to know our God can't play church anymore church means we come Sunday sing a few songs go home no it's time to wake up to spiritual realities it's time to walk on earth with heaven in mind that every one of you God has a purpose to touch people for eternity that there's a gift in you there's an ability there's a talent there is the Holy Spirit on the inside of you that wants to use you to shake kingdoms shake companies shake families and shake a nation and every one of you are part of that commission today. Now I'm reminded about the ten virgins waiting for the bride to come. They were all ready. It means they were all in church. They were church people doing the work, waiting for the bridegroom. But the bridegroom delayed, the parable says. And they all fell asleep. There's something about falling asleep in church. I don't know what it is. They all fell asleep and then what happens, the bells ring and they said, oh, the bridegroom is coming. So they all stood up and if you go read it, they all lit their lamps. But then it says the five ran out of oil. They didn't have enough oil and they asked the others, oh, please give us some of your oil. They said, no, we don't have enough for you. Go to the marketplace. And they missed their opportunity. And so this morning I want, I've come to say to you, don't miss this opportunity. Don't miss this opportunity to make right with God today. I've come to ask you this morning, are you ready for eternity? When I was in England a couple of weeks ago, I had a Scottish man, he says, this is how I put it, he says, he says, where would you be today if you died yesterday? Made me think that's a bit different. Where would you be today if you died yesterday? Are you ready for the bridegroom? Are you ready to live with purpose? with a mandate, with eternity in mind. 
And so with every eye closed, we've got just two, three minutes. I want to ask you that question. Where are you going? If you're here this morning and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, He wants to come and bring purpose into your life. He wants to bring freedom into your life. He wants to bring authority into your life. He wants to bring growth into your life. That's what Jesus wants to do. He wants to take hold of your life and turn it upside down and right side up. So with all the ashes standing, if you're here this morning and you want to pray this prayer, I want to pray with you to receive Jesus. I'm going to count to three, after three, I want you just to raise your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. All we're going to do is pray together. And I want you just to acknowledge that saying, Pastor Sam, I need this Jesus in my life. I'm, I've had enough of just knowing about him. I need to know him. That is you on the count of three. One, two, three. Quickly, that's you. Quickly raise your hand. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Hands are going up. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Just keep your hands raised. I should just wait. Don't hand cards out yet. Just keep your hands raised. To look over the congregation, hands are going up all at the back there. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Now, if you raise your hand, you can put it down. Now, I want you to pray this prayer with me, church. With your eyes closed, let's pray this prayer. Say, Dear Lord, I ask you today to forgive me and to wash me, cleanse me of all my sin. Lord Jesus, I confess with my mouth that you died for my sin and that you rose again and that you are the son of the living God. Today, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord praise this morning. But I haven't come just to preach a message and you go home. I've come to challenge you come to challenge you today you know I read this story on Facebook and I took a photo and I thought it was just so good of what I was trying to portray today and it's about a boy and a dad and this boy he asks his father he says dad what is the size of God the father looked up in the sky and he saw a plane and he asked his son what is the size of that plane the boy looked up into the sky he said dad it's very small I can hardly see it. it. It is tiny. The father then took the son to the airport and stood in front of a massive 747 Boeing. And he said to his son, how big is this plane? And the boy replied, wow, dad, this plane is massive. This plane is huge. It is powerful, dad. The father looked at the son. He said, son, God's size depends on how close or how far you are to him you see the closer you are to him the greater he will be in your life it's time that we as Christians know our God and when we know our God strength comes great exploits come we resist the plans of the enemy so this morning, we normally don't do this, but I want to say, if you're saying, Samuel, it's time that I move away from just knowing about God to know God, I want you to quickly just stand. It's not a salvation call. This is just a commitment saying, I want to step out of the old and into the new. Just quickly, just stand. We're going to pray. Quickly. Come on. You say you had enough of just playing church. You've had enough of just playing Christianity. It's time to say, Lord, I'm making a commitment to have a personal relationship with you. I don't want to just play Christianity. I don't want to just be a good person. I want a personal relationship with you. Quickly, if that is you, just quickly stand. Thank you, Lord. If you're standing, why don't you just raise your hands. Father, here we are this morning. We're making a commitment to step out of the old and step into the new. Lord, we're standing to say, Father, we want a personal relationship with you. We might know a lot about you, but maybe we don't know you. And we're asking that from today, Lord, we will come to know you personally. That, Lord, we would know your heart and know your thoughts and know your dreams, know your passions for our lives. Lord, today we stand and we make a commitment that from today we will spend time with you, Lord. That from today, Lord, we will put resources to spend time with you. That from today, Lord, we'll have a conversation. Communication lines will be open with you. That from today, Lord, we choose to serve you and to lay our lives down from, for you. Right now, from this moment, 
We make this commitment to you in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen.